This is James Gully. I'm a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health, and today we're going to be talking about ethics in the conduct of research part three, fabrication and falsification. We'll be sharing a couple of real life examples of research misconduct. First one is a clinician, Eric Pullman, who was involved in several different clinical protocols and admitted to falsifications and fabrications of clinical results. We'll talk a little bit about this case. So one of his staff detected inappropriate data management and reported it. He was involved in a longitudinal menopause study and re he reportedly studied 35 women at baseline and again three years later. All but three of these patients had fabricated and falsified data. This data was published in the Annals of Medicine and six other academic journals and was used in nine NIH and two USDA grant applications. In this study, he exaggerated the number of patients tested and he changed values to create a trend in the aging process to make this data look better. He presented this data in three grant applications. In addition, there was a prospective hormone replacement study that he reported on. This was a double-blinded study, and he presented preliminary data in two grant applications when he did not have access to the unblinding, so there was no way he could have had data to present in these applications. He had applied for about $11.6 million in funding and was awarded $2.9 million. From 2000 to 2004, both the University of Vermont and the NIH investigated Dr. Pullman. They found that he presented false testimony and documents and influenced other witnesses to provide false documents. He eventually admitted to the destruction of electronic evidence of falsifications and fabrications. The findings of misconduct resulted in a 366-day federal prison term for Dr. Pullman because his actions led to a loss of government funds, obstruction of justice, and abuse of a position of trust. He was also barred for life from receiving any funding from any federal agency and was permanently excluded from any federal health care program, including Medicare and Medicaid. Dr. Pullman justified his actions as follows. He said minor points were misrepresented to ensure that the grant was refunded. He said his, his lab staff were dependent on the grant for their salaries, and he wanted to be recognized as an important contributor to his field. Next, we're going to talk about another case. Mark Hauser was a Harvard professor of psychology and director of Harvard's Cognitive Evolution Laboratory. Questions arose when his lab assistant was asked to analyze the results of the experiment. He had this experiment where they would play tones to monkeys and they would see if the monkeys could recognize patterns. And the tones would be something like ABA or AAA. And if they re would repeat the um, tones, then the monkeys, according to Dr. Hauser, would look at um, the speaker and they were to correlate how many times the monkeys looked at the speaker um, when there was repetition versus no repetition. Unfortunately, when this, uh, it came to light when one of the lab assistants was asked to review these tapes and found that there was no association with um, the regularity uh, or repetition of the tones and the monkeys looking at the speakers. He brought this to other people within Harvard and eventually Harvard investigated and found Hauser guilty of misconduct and the case was turned over to the federal authorities. Ironically, Dr. Hauser at the time was working on another book entitled Evilicious, Why We Evolved a Taste for Being Bad. He put in his resignation in 2011, and he, um, in his resignation letter, he 
states that he'd been offered some exciting opportunities in the private sector and was going to go um, to the private sector. So what is the fallout from these acts of research misconduct? Certainly one thing is that other scientists become angry because they've spent time and resources trying to replicate this manipulated data. Institutional reputations are also damaged. An entire disciplines may be tarnished, such as the hematopoietic stem cell transplant for solid tumors that we talked about in section two. In addition, patients and their families cannot understand why the promising results they had heard about are no longer valid, and they may lose trust in researchers or in research in general. The Republic relies on our truthfulness as investigators, so misconduct can undermine science in general. So what happens at the NIH in the intramural program when misconduct is, um, is found or when it is possible that mis uh, misconduct has occurred? Well, any allegations are reported immediately to the REO. This is the NIH Agency Intramural Research Integrity Officer. An assessment then is carried out to determine if the allegation meets the definition of misconduct. An inquiry committee examines the evidence to determine if an investigation is needed. So this is the preliminary step just to see, does this meet the definition of scientific misconduct and should there be an investigation? If that is suggested, then an investigation committee will determine if scientific misconduct has occurred and the ARLO, this is the Agency Research Integrity Liaison Officer, may concur and would be the one to impose any sanctions. So why would somebody manipulate scientific data? One thing that has come out consistently is that they want to make their data appear more convincing. And yes, this is um, a common reason that is being given for data manipulation. How about they need a scientific result to support their hypothesis? Yes, this is also not uncommon for scientists to be so convinced of their hypothesis that they manipulate the data to make it fit their model. Often we hear about them needing to um, to finish a manuscript, they need one piece of data and they just don't have it ready in time, but they want to go ahead and get the manuscript done so that nobody else scoops them. And they say, well, while the paper is being out for review, we're going to make sure that this is really what happens and we can always change the results in the um, response to the reviewers. Or perhaps they had to give a talk the next day and they didn't have all the data. Maybe they're preparing for the talk and they say, oh, if we'd only done this one experiment, maybe that would um, be the results and the outcome. So maybe we can just put in this data and, and then I can take it out um, once uh, I have the actual data. This will just be a placeholder for now. And that is not acceptable. So just remember, if you're caught manipulating scientific data, you could be barred for life from ever receiving government, government financial support for your research or even be sentenced to jail. This is another case where a medical student came forward and reported potential trouble in a scientist's lab at Duke. And Eventually, this made the cancer letter, and this scientist did uh, lose his grant, uh, funding support um, from the American Cancer Society, almost uh, a $729,000 grant, and 10 papers were retracted because of this. So it's important if you see something, say something. So now we're going to go to the question for this section. And this is going to be going back over both sections two and three and discussing whether what we saw was fabrication or falsification. For, so for Huang, with the cloning 
uh, of, of the stem cells. Was this fabrication or falsification? Well, it turns out that nine out of 11 cell lines were fabricated, so there was fabrication, but there was also falsification with image manipulation. How about Beswoda for the transplant, uh, the hematopoietic stem cell transplant in breast cancer? Well, he made up the number of patients, so that's fabrication, and he stated that he had consent from these patients when, in fact, there was no consent that forms that could be uh, found and there was no IRB approval of the pro protocol, so this was falsification. How about the measles vaccine with Wakefield? Well, the colitis completely fabricated in many of the patients. There was no evidence of this and the patients didn't, uh, patients and their families didn't recall any evidence of colitis. And the dates of reaction were uh, fudged to make this after the, uh, the vaccination. So this was falsification. How about Pullman for the longitudinal studies in breast cancer? Well, he, ma he made up the number of patients, he exaggerated the number of patients um, that we, he actually had data on, and he destroyed data. So this is part of the falsification. Finally, with Hauser, with the monkey studies, the sounds for the, the, the uh, monkeys, that was fabricated. There was no data that the monkeys actually looked at the speakers, and the response was also falsified. Um, So what I want to leave you with then is that it is imperative for us to take our job seriously in, sci in uh, science and remember that science is truth and we have to build upon a bedrock of solid truth for us to make progress. Thank you for listening today.